wish I could do that kind of thing, guys. One day I'm going to. I really am. I, uh, I've tried every musical instrument in the world. I started out with a um, guitar. I gave up on that, so I had too many strings, so I went to a ukulele. That didn't work either. I tried a flute. I tried a, I tried a mandolin. I really did try a mandolin. Uh, tried a, a harmonica. I've ended up with a tambourine. <laughs> and I can play a mean tambourine, folks. I'm telling you, I really can. So thank you for letting me be with you. I'm looking forward. I've been so excited about this week. You know, I, I got excited last night watching television. Both games, the Georgia and the Alabama game. I'm sorry, I, didn't, I wasn't supposed to say that. I, I, had a, I have a Georgia bow tie, and I thought it might be too much. Uh, there might be somebody from Tennessee here that would take exception to that, so I didn't do that. But I am excited about being here. Uh, I've just been looking forward to it for a long, long time. Chris is a good brother, and I appreciate him inviting me. And So anyway, I hope you come. You know, th what I consider this week to be is more important than any football game you'll ever watch on TV. Okay? I really do. And I'll say this, that if you were to think, if you were to think that um, if you come every night this week, your life would be changed for all eternity, just say that it could happen. You'd never be the same again. Would you make it a priority to be here? I hope you do. I really hope you do. Your church is prepared tremendously. Uh, and what I'm going to preach on, it's, you need more than one. It'll, it'll, it'll get to a point. So anyway, we'll get started. Uh, I'm glad Chris Witt said about lunch because my nine-minute sermon is going to turn into about a 20-minute sermon. And you don't have to go any place for lunch. Amen? 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 Listen, folks, you've got to respond to me or we will be here all day, Okay. <laughs> I preached in a black church not long ago. It went three hours. They kept me going, so some of you won't say a word now. If you have your Bibles, if you'll turn with me, please, to the book of Jeremiah. And you're thinking, eh, why did he have to pick that one? That's a hard one to find. It's on page 689. Some of you caught that, some of you didn't. Jeremiah 17, beginning with verse 5. If you're able, if you'll stand with me, please, as we read the Word of God. Should I give you another minute or two? Did you find that one? You know, you know the reason they have a, a table of contents in the front? It's for Jeremiah people. Jeremiah 17, beginning with verse 5. This is what the Lord says. Well, let me, before I do that, excuse me, um, I want you to really think about this because there's a contrast. There are four verses, a contrast, and then another four verses. You look at the contrast. This is what the Lord says. Cursed is the one who trusts in man, who draws strength from mere flesh, whose heart turns away from the Lord. That person will be like a bush in the wastelands. They will not see prosperity when it comes. They will dwell in the parched places of the desert in a salt land where no one lives. But, but blessed is the one who trusts in the Lord, whose confidence is in him. He will be like a tree planted by the water that sends out its roots by the stream. It does not fear when heat comes. Its leaves are always green. It has no worries, of, no worries in a year of drought and never fails to bear food, fruit. The grass withers and the flowers fade, but the word of our God stands forever. Thanks be to God. Thank you. Be seated, please. Jeremiah was a prophet in a very perilous time. His, his small country of Judah had virtually been destroyed. And Jeremiah spent his entire ministry trying to get God's people to go in a certain direction. They were hard-headed. They didn't want to do that. Jeremiah said, go this way. And they said, thank you, but we want to go this way. Jeremiah said, this way. They said, this way. Jeremiah, I call Jeremiah the frustrated prophet. It reminds me of some Methodist preachers I know. Frustrated because the people wouldn't obey what God wanted to do. But Jeremiah started complaining. Now, I, I, you folks probably have never complained. Jeremiah complained. Let me, let me give you, jump back to chapter 12. 
uh, the first verse, first, first verse alone. You're always righteous, O Lord, when I bring a case before you. Yet I would speak with you about your justice. Why does the way of the wicked prosper? Why do all the faithless live at ease? <laughs> it reminds me of a lot of things right there. It reminds me when I'm speaking to my children when they were young. They're both grown now and have grandchildren. But, but when they were young, you know, I, I'd say, Lord, why? Why? Why is this happening to me? I don't deserve this. Why me? God wants to bless Jeremiah. And listen to me carefully. God wants to bless us. He wants to bless every person here in the sanctuary this morning. He wants to bless you. He wants to bless me. Look at Jeremiah 29. This is a very familiar passage of Scripture. Jeremiah 29, verse 11 says this. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Hmm. Plans to prosper you. He's speaking to Jeremiah. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you hope in a future. My church that I pastor now, I'm an evangelist full-time and a pastor full-time. I don't know how you do that both full-time, but I am. But the... They have a tagline under the name of the church, New Prospect Church, something to hope for. Something to hope for. A lot of people, maybe some of you have lost hope. Maybe some of you are asking the question, why me? Why is this happening to my family? Why is this happening to my kids? Why is it happening to my grandkids? Why me, we say. Why me? Why am I not blessed? You see... Basically, as Christians, we can either win or we can lose. There's no middle ground. God wants us to be winners. The legendary coach, Bear Bryant, who turned over in his grave last night, Bear Bryant said this, winning isn't everything, but it beats anything that comes in second. You either win in the Christian life or you lose in the Christian life. I want to be a winner. God wants me to be a winner. God wants you to be a winner. And we can be. We really can be. But so often, I talk to people that say, why is this happening? I just don't feel blessed of God. And some people are not blessed of God. And the question I have is, why? Why are we not blessed? Two reasons. Number one, so often we just miss the blessings of God. They're coming all the time. I believe God's trying to bless me. He's trying to bless you every day. Every minute of every day, he wants to bless you. But for some reason, they just got to go, shoom. We never see them. We miss them. We totally, completely miss them. Every church I ever preach in has a lot of things that are the same. So this, the, the children's, I think, had, had a participatory part of the youth. Children, I guess it was. This is your time. This is the only time I'll let, I'll let you yell back at me, okay? What does every church have in common? Yell out something. People. What? People. People. Some of the churches I'm preaching don't have many. <laughs> preaching to the church one time, they flew me all the way to Pennsylvania for six people. Steeple. What? A steeple? No. My church doesn't have a steeple. Sorry. What else? A pulpit. I don't use my pulpit in my church. But yeah, what? It's there. It's there. <laughs> You're supposed to be back there. Had one guy tell me one time, an older preacher said, stay behind the sacred desk. I felt guilty the whole week when I wasn't behind the sacred desk, but I won't be there this week. What else? One more. Altar. What? Altar. An altar. No. Believe it or not, no. I'm preaching some gymnasiums and stuff. I'm sorry? The cross. It ought to have the cross. One year at General Conference, I'll never forget this. They met in an auditorium. And they were having a worship service. There were 2,000 people there. And a lady stands up in the back and screams, Where's the cross? The next service, there was a cross. But here's something you, you won't guess. <laughs> Uh, you really won't. It's a thermostat. 
And I've decided, Chris, that the major problem in all churches is not theological, it's the thermostat. You have more people complain, whether it's too hot or too cold, all in the same service, by the way. I decided you ought to put dummy thermostats on every pew so people can adjust it to, to their comfort level. Are you with me? Amen. But there's a, di <laughs> there's a difference now. Now, listen to me. There's a difference between a thermostat and a thermometer. Okay? A thermometer, what's on the inside of a thermometer? Mercury. And the mercury, when it gets hot, what does it do? Rises. I mentioned, I'm a PE major. It goes up, okay? When it gets cold, what does it do? It goes down. Hot, up, cold, down. Thermostat's different. You set it at 70 degrees. It doesn't move unless somebody moves it. It stays there whether it's 50 or 100. I've seen churches now that have it locked. There's a plastic case around it. It locks it so people can't move it, okay? But here, here's a thermometer. Up, down, up, down, up, down, up, down. Uh, depending on the outward circumstances. Thermostat, it stays set at 70 degrees unless somebody changes it. Our lives are much like a thermometer. Depending on the outward circumstances, things are going great at home. I, I'm blessed. I didn't have enough fight with my wife. I'm blessed. My children are doing well. I'm blessed. My children are not doing well. I'm not. I had to fight my wife before I left. No, I, I didn't because I, I promise you I didn't. But let's say I did. I'm not blessed. We go up and down and up and down. Are you with me? We go up and down thinking we're blessed by the outward circumstances. Your blessings have nothing to do with your outward circumstance. Nothing. We need to be like the thermostat. When God blesses you and you know he's blessing you and you're in love with him and he's in love with you, you are blessed, my friends. And it does not depend on the outward circumstances, whether you're sick or hurt or whatever. It doesn't depend on that. That's another reason. Now, back to the scripture very quickly. The scripture says that when we are blessed, here's what's going to happen. We're either going to be a tree or a bush. A tree or a bush. That's what will happen. And when the storms of life come, that's like a bush. When the things of life are going great, it's like a, it's like a tree. I was, um, I was preaching in Arizona one time. I had never, excuse me, I'm West Texas. Preaching in West Texas one time. I'd never preached in Texas before, especially West Texas. And West Texas, you, you, you can drive down the interstate, and, and they're straight. There's no curves. Are you with me? You could drive 90 miles an hour. I mean, it just, you, you could watch your dog leave for three days. I mean, it just goes forever. We were riding down the road. We were really going fast. I, I was riding, and the pastor was... was driving, and all of a sudden something came toward me, scared me to death. It just, it was rolling across the desert, and it was about to hit our car, and I think, we're going to die, we're going to die, this thing's going to hit her, he's not slowing down, and it hit us, and it was a tumbleweed, and it just kind of bounced off, didn't even know it hardly. I don't want to be like a tumbleweed, I don't want to be like a bush, has no root, I, I want to be like a tree, and when you're blessed, you're like a tree, because it has deep roots, it stands. When the storms of life come, and every one of us have had storms, or maybe you're in a storm right now, or you will be in a storm. The blessings fall on the just and the unjust just alike. When you go through the storm, you have to be the tree, folks. I know so many people that when the storm of life came, and they were Christians, they got wiped away. They're not there anymore. God wants us to be blessed like a tree. And here's what he, he describes the tree in the scripture. He says, your roots will go deep. And then here it is. And your leaves, listen, to the, these are the words of scripture. Your leaves will always be green. Whoa. Unless it's a pine tree. Those are not leaves. Your leaves will always be green. What's that mean? Uh, my last full-time church was uh, in Monroe, Georgia. First church, Monroe. And we... We built a house there. They, they gave us a, a, a building, a housing allowance, and so we built a house there. It was really cool. We, but it, we built it in the woods. I mean, in the middle of the woods. And especially in the front yard area, there was this humongous oak tree. Huge thing. And every fall, right about this time of the year, I'd look outside and 
think, hmm. My wife said, it's time to rake the leaves. I said, honey, you know what, honey? God planted that tree there. He took a little acorn. He planted that tree probably 100 years ago. It's a huge tree. And, and that tree, God caused that acorn to grow, and that tree grew, and, and he got bigger and bigger and bigger. And then every, every spring, leaves would come on that tree. Every summer, they'd be beautiful. Every fall, they'd turn colors. And every winter, the leaves would fall to the ground, and that's where God wants them to be, right where he put them. She never bought that. But what I'm saying is, your leaves are not always green. What's God saying? I think he's saying it's a supernatural thing, folks. The only way you will be blessed continually is being supernaturally blessed. The things around you won't bless you. It's a supernatural thing. Your leaves will always be green. And then he goes on to say, uh, the tree will will always never, excuse me, never fail to bear fruit. Never fail to bear fruit. When you're, when you're blessed, you'll never fail to bear fruit. He's not talking about the gifts of the Spirit, but I think he's talking about the fruit of the Spirit. That's the fruit. You know, the love, the joy, the peace, the patience, all, 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 and basically the last one, self-control. When you're blessed of God, you'll always have those. That's what it takes. Verse 8, the last part of verse 8 says, When you're blessed of God, you will have no fear when the heat comes. What's the heat? That's the hard times. You'll have no fear when the heat comes. And then it says, You'll have no worries in years of drought. Now here's a question, rhetorical. Please don't answer out loud. Are you in heat and drought right now? Are you in fearful right now? Are you worrying right now? Here's another question. Is it a sin to worry? That's what it says. If you're trusting in him, he's blessing you. You have no need, so that's... Are you saying, Tom, you never worry? No, I didn't say that. But I said, I think it is a sin. That's what it's talking about here, is that we'll have no need to fear or worry because God's still there. So how does this happen? How does this happen in our lives? Chris said I'd been in evangelism for 23, probably been about 25 years. He didn't tell you how long I was a pastor before that because he didn't want you to know how old I am. A long time ago. I pastored for 23 years. I've been pastoring. I've been in evangelism for like 25 years. But when I was there, the first, first year, Billy Graham decided to have a conference in Louisville, Kentucky. It was called NACI. NACI stood for North American Conference for Itinerant Evangelists. That's itinerant, not idiot. Itinerant. You know what itinerant means? It means that it's a preacher that no church wants more than a week. You move, you keep moving, you go, go, go. And it was, a, it was just a conference for itinerant evangelists, for full-time evangelists. So my wife and I went. We met some, another couple there from Kentucky. We've been friends ever since. It was, it was the most marvelous conference I've ever been to in my entire life. Never been anything like it since. Uh, it was, they, had, they brought in the best preachers. And, you know, Billy Graham spoke one night. Chuck Colson spoke one night. Uh, Adrian Rogers spoke one night. Just, just, just great, great, great. Dennis Kinlaw spoke one night. Great preachers. They gave us a different book every day. The, everything, it just When Billy Graham did something, it was first class. Uh, shoebox, first class. Didn't spare any expenses. So one night, Adrian Rogers was preaching. You know the name Adrian Rogers? Great Baptist preacher from Tennessee. Uh, I heard him this week. I, long story, I won't get into this, but Speaking of dogs, um, I never thought I'd be a cat person until we, my wife picks up anything that looks lonely. That's how I got married. Um, one day there was this strange, ugly, skinny cat like I've never seen before. I mean, just looked like he hadn't eaten in a month. I said, honey, we can't keep this cat. I know, I know. She said, just put him in your office and lock the door and 
Tomorrow we'll take him to the vet and we'll figure out what we're going to do. And I went down there the next morning and there were four things laying under that cat. And they were alive. Never thought in my million years I'd be a cat person. How did I get off on that subject? But Adrian was preaching... And he was, he was saying that, um, telling a story about a, a preacher by the name of um, Joseph Zong. Joseph was the Billy Graham of the Methodist Church in Romania. Uh, this was about two years ago, or two years after the Iron Curtain had fallen. Communism was gone. And... Uh, Adrian Rogers got a chance to go over there and visit, and he visited with Joseph Song. Now, Joseph, you've got to realize, when communism came in, they killed most of the pastors. They were afraid to kill him because he was so well-known. They would be a martyr. And so they put him in a, a dungeon. And a long time they took him out of a dungeon was to work. And the way he worked was to carry a cross member, a cross tie, a railroad cross tie, on his back. Partially paralyzed him. Great preacher. He, there was a, a hole where the arrow could go in, and he would preach and just scream and yell, and people would gather around, and they tried to keep him away, and they kept coming. Joseph Song was a great man. So he got a, after communism fell, he got invitations to come to some big, probably Baptist churches in America, and he, and he was talking to a pastor, or talking to uh, Adrian one day at that church, and he said, he said, you know, he said, uh, I, I love preaching in your churches, and he said. I speak a little English, and I hear a lot better English. I understand it a lot better than I preach it. But I can hear enough that I can pick up words. <clears throat> he said, oh, really? He said, he said, there's a word in your church that I hear all the time. And Adrian said, well, what word do you think that is? He said, well, I, I, I hear the word commitment all the time. You've got to commit to the church. You've got to commit to tithe. You've got to commit to Jesus. I hear this word all the time. And Adrian said, well, that's good. That's a good word. He said, no, it's not. <laughs> Adrian said, what do you mean it's not? He said, that's not a good word. What do you mean? He said, because that word has taken the place of another word that's much, much better. And you don't hear this other word anymore in churches. And he said, what word do you think commitment's taking the place of? He said, it's taken the place of the word surrender. And he said, there's a big difference, folks. He said this, when you commit to do something, you make the decision about what you're going to commit. You commit to come to church. You commit to come to Sunday school. You commit to tithe. You commit to come to revival. You make the decision about what you're going to commit. But when you surrender, as the old hymn says, I surrender all. You want to be blessed? There's only one way. I surrender all. You surrender your life, you surrender your family, you surrender your church, you surrender your worries. You, surrender. There's, it's, you, can't, you can't partially surrender. It's like being partially pregnant. Either you are or you're not. So the question I, I ask you this morning, is everything surrendered? Now let me share with you one quick story, and, and I'm through, I promise. Um, I had a chance a long time ago to Israel. Um, my son and daughter-in-law are there right now, this moment, as, we, as I'm speaking. They are there. They've never been before. And I told him, I said, when you go to Israel, I said, I'm sure your tour will be to go to the Dead Sea. You need to go to the Dead Sea somehow. The Dead Sea, I don't know if you're familiar, how familiar you are with the Dead Sea, but the Dead Sea is salt water coming in and no water leaving. And so all that's left is the saltiest water in the entire world. Cosmetic country uh, co companies are around the shores. And, and I found out that Andrews told me, he said, we're going to be in a hotel. <clears throat> we're going to spend the night there. And I see, said, you need to go swimming in the Dead Sea. You got that?
flip it off. I, if you can figure it out, there you go, thank you. You know what they're yelling about, what they're excited about? You cannot sink in the Dead Sea. It's so salty, it's so buoyant. You could literally, they were sitting there laying on their backs in four feet of water, laying on their backs with their hands and the legs up in the air. You can't sink. It's impossible. That leads me to the last story. It's, there's a story about a man who was in a boat on the Dead Sea. And somehow he fell out. He was by himself, fell out, and started screaming, I can't swim, I can't swim! And he started slashing and hitting the water and saying, help, 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 I'm, I'm drowning, I'm drowning, somebody help me, I'm, I, I, I can't swim, please help me, help! And he realized nobody was there to help him. And he finally he just screamed out, I'll just die, I'll just die, I give up, I'll die. And he gave up and, of course, he floated. Didn't die. You can't do enough to be blessed. But when you surrender, when you give up, you give up the fear, you give up the worry, you give up the anxiety, when you give up and let Jesus do it for you, handle it for you, that's when you get blessed. Let's bow our heads together, please. Lord God, we... Uh, I don't know hardly anybody here, but you know everybody here. You know our hearts. You know where we are. You know where we need to be. Lord, I pray the next few moments as we uh, look to you, that you would enable us, even this morning. I know it's a Sunday morning. I understand that. You do too. But there's somebody here tonight that can't wait. It's time to surrender. Whatever it is, it's time to surrender to the Lord. So I'm going to ask you to stand. We're going to sing just a couple of verses of a song. And, you know, let me, let me tell you how I do invitations. I don't do 50 verses of just as I am, okay? Uh, we'll sing a couple of verses. If God's working on your heart, come and kneel here or stand here. Now, do you have to come? No. Can you make a decision where you are? Yes. But I've been doing this a long time, and I found when you have the the courage to stand, to get up, come forward, something happens. And I think there's some people here this morning that morning said, there's something in my life I need to surrender. Maybe you need to surrender your life to Christ. Maybe you need to surrender your situations to Christ. I'm not going to bug you. If you want to kneel here, that's fine. If you put your hand out, I'll be glad to pray with you. Otherwise, we'll leave you alone with the Lord. But it's a step of faith, a step of faith that you're willing to surrender whatever it is the Lord Jesus Christ, we invite you to come and kneel right now.